Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see this crowd. Good evening. Welcome to Does the Brains Wiring Make Us Who We Are? I'm Stuart Firestein, the current chairman of the Department of Biological Sciences here at Columbia and a member of New Right, the organization presenting this tonight. I thought I'd start this off very quickly with a, a short uh, quote from Erwin Schrodinger, um, the famous physicist and occasional philosopher, who said, If you cannot, in the long run, tell everyone what you have been doing, your doing is worthless. And that's what New Right is dedicated to. New Right is a band of indefatigable graduate students and in neuroscience and nonfiction writing who meet every other week uh, and for a long evening's worth of discussion as to how to write science for a public audience. Science that on the one hand doesn't bore the eyeballs out of people's sockets, and on the other hand doesn't cheat them of the hard stuff. And part of what we do is these kind of outreach programs where we want to present public events in which the most current science, and in this particular case the most current neuroscience, can be brought to a wider public audience. So I have some people to thank for this event tonight. Let me do that first. Because an event like this uh, doesn't just happen. It takes a vast amount of human effort. It takes a lot of resources. Just, I guess, a nice way to say money. In particular, I want to thank a few members of the New Right group for their, for their individual contributions and exceptional efforts. Tim Reckwarth, Carl Schoonover, Rebecca Brockman, Armin Ankalapov, and Punita Bansali, all of whom are here and wandering about tonight. Um, as for the resources, the Dana Foundation uh, has been an incredibly reliable supporter of all things neuroscience, both at Columbia and around the, around the world, really. And um, we're especially grateful to them for providing the seed money for this evening. So a special thanks to the Dana Foundation. And because of their initial support, we were able to go out and get a, a gratifyingly eclectic group of supporters to join them. They include the Department of Biological Sciences, not because I'm chairman, <laughs> a little bit because I'm chairman, but <laughs> the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, the School of the Arts, the Office of the Executive Vice President for Research at Columbia, the Department of Neuroscience, the Department of Pharmacology at the Medical School, President Lee Bollinger and the Office of the President, and the Italian Academy. Told you it was eclectic. So the Italian Academy actually runs a very uh, interesting program in neuroscience and the arts and has been interested in our work as well. So about a decade ago, in 2002, a cancer researcher named Yuri Lezebnik, who was at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, still there, published a little commentary in an issue of Cell called Can a Biologist Fix a Radio? And the question he posed was, can a biologist understand, in his particular case, his interest was intracellular interactions, the wiring diagram as it was of a cell. That is, the, the incredibly complicated pathways that go on inside a cell that involve dozens, maybe hundreds of enzymes and molecules that decide whether a cell will become malignant or dead, for example. And, and he compared that to the way a, uh, an engineer thinks about a radio. That an engineer can explain a radio to other engineers, to himself, can understand the radio with a parts list and a wiring diagram. And can a biologist do this with a cell? Well, I think the question is still a very legitimate question. It's the one we're going to talk about tonight. And I think it is, it is as they say in the theoretical lingo, a scalable question. So we could ask, can a neurobiologist fix a radio? Or the real question we'll ask tonight is, does a parts list and a wiring diagram provide a satisfactory description of a brain and maybe even a way to repair it should it, should it break. So uh, I'd like to um, introduce the people who are going to do this. I, I, I want to note, by the way, this is, this is sort of important, that scientists have this sort of debate pretty regularly. They have this discussion, this debate, this kind of argument pretty regularly, but they usually do it in the pages of journals or at a conference or quite often in the bar. Um, but they don't often do it publicly. And to actually air this out in public is quite an interesting event, I think. And so I want to especially thank our two gladiators this evening for their willingness to show you the innards of a scientific debate, uh, which can be kind of ugly. So let me introduce the two of them, um, beginning with, sorry, beginning with Sebastian Sung. Sebastian is professor of computation. <laughs> Already we're starting with this? 
I'm going to read this so I get it right. Sebastian Sung is a professor of computational neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, scientific director of Wired Differently, a nonprofit organization with the ultimate goals of seeing the material basis of memory and finding connectopathies or miswirings of the brain long hypothesized to be associated with psychiatric disorders. He received his PhD in theoretical physics from Harvard University and formerly worked at Bell Laboratories. His new book, Connectome, How the Brain's Wiring Makes Us Who We Are, was held in the Wall Street Journal as the best lay book. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the best lay book on brain science I've ever read. I'm sorry, Sebastian. I really did think you'd hit the jackpot there for the, for the moment. <laughs> the, uh, the book, by the way, signed by its now notable author, is available in the lobby after the, uh, after the presentation. So welcome, Sebastian. Professor Anthony Movshin is university professor, silver professor, and director of the Center for Neural Science at New York University. He studies how neurons in the cerebral cortex encode information about visual form and motion, and how those neurons contribute to visual perception to the control of visually guided action. He received his PhD from Cambridge University and then joined the faculty at NYU, first in the Department of Psychology and then as founding director of the Center for Neural Science. He's won numerous awards for his work and has been recognized by his peers, especially as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science. We welcome Tony above 96th Street. Thank you. Now, for this matchup, we've hired two ref uh, moderators um, <laughs> who are in their own right quite reputable. Robert Krolrich has been a correspondent for ABC and CBS News for more than 20 years, covering a variety of subjects, but in particular science. I think he's now best known as half. Uh, I would say actually slightly more than half, but uh, half of the radio team responsible for the fabulously popular NPR radio show, uh, NPR science show Radio Lab. Radio Lab won a Peabody in 2011. Um, but most importantly, I have to say that, that I, I think this program probably reaches a larger audience than any other science show uh, in history, which is a remarkable achievement on its own. Uh, Robert, by the way, is a graduate of Columbia's Law School. Welcome, Robert Krolwich. And finally, Carl Zimmer, who has his own byline in the New York Times, writes regularly for the Science Times, as well as Discovery Magazine, where he was formerly a senior editor. He's written a remarkable 12 science books and innumerable articles. He is the two-time winner of the American Association for the Advancement of Science Journalism Award for his work at the Times and for his blog, The Loom. But I have to say I think the greatest compliment I can give to Carl is that he is a journalist that scientists trust to get it right. So Carl, welcome. So once again, Thank you all for coming to this. I'm going to hand it over to our two capable moderators. And as they say at the main event in Las Vegas, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> All right, so we're going we're gonna to start tonight with some very, very, very big questions. Um, let me just say that the poet Diane Ackerman put it this way. Mind, she says, is such an odd predicament for matter to get into. I often marvel how something like hydrogen, the simplest atom forged in some early chaos of the universe, could lead to us and to the gorgeous fever we call consciousness. If mind is just a few pounds of blood, dream, and electric, how does it manage to contemplate itself, worry about its soul, do time and motion studies, admire the shy hooves of a goat, know that it will die, 
enjoy all the grand and lesser mayhems of the heart. What is mind that one can be out of ones? How can a neuron feel compassion? What is a self? Well, both of our guests tonight have been thinking about these questions, looking into this riddle that is the mind for years now. Somewhere along the way, they find themselves on very different paths. Where one wants to go, the other says, no, let's go this way. No, the other one says, I think we'll go that way. And so, because the stakes are large, the moment is ripe, and the disagreement's very, very real, thank you to Neurite and Radiolab in Columbia, Carl Zimmer and I, we decided to help you guys listen to Sebastian and Tony argue about whether it's a good idea to create a highly detailed map of the human brain. The question is, do we need to create a map that will eventually describe every neuron in our heads, or don't we? And the deeper question underlying that is, as our title says, does the brain's wiring really make us who we are? So first, wearing the stunning footwear that I am simply... <laughs> It almost doesn't seem fair, but anyway. <laughs> In favor of such a map, Sebastian Sook. You have five minutes, and then I'll watch it really closely. <laughs> well, thanks, Bob. And thank you all for coming out and sharing, I think, what is the greatest adventure. I'm biased, of course, but the greatest adventure that uh, humanity is delving into. How can we understand how the brain works, and how can we improve it? How can we fix it? Now, I'd like to clarify a little bit my position. So I'm, some people sometimes say that I'm calling for the entire connectome of an entire human brain and we need that and we need that right now and we won't be able to do science until we have that. And actually my claims are not that. In fact, what we're working on right now is a cubic millimeter sized piece of brain tissue and often we're working on animals instead of humans. A human, entire human brain is too far in the future to argue about. But what I would argue is that just mapping the connections in a small chunk of brain would add to the information we have about activity and uh, about genes, and it would add in a very important way. It would provide information that has been missing and hindering the progress of neuroscience for a long time. Now, I could make a general argument about the genome and the connectome and about how there were all these people who were against the genome, but look, all that information turned out to be useful. But that's a, a very general argument. I'd like to be more specific than that. I want to point out three areas where I think neuroscience has been stuck and where more information about connections might help us. The first is the area of perception. And uh, my worthy adversary, Tony Mofshan, is a world leader in the study of neural coding, of sticking electrodes in the brain and trying to understand how the signals of a single neuron encode the properties of a visual stimulus. He and his, his uh, colleagues have discovered many amazing things, but I would say that the study of neural coding is not enough. It's not enough to understand how perception works. We have to understand how neurons compute the information that is studied by the experiments of Tony. And to do that, we have to know something about how neurons are connected. The second area is that of memory. For a long time, neuroscientists have hypothesized that memories are stored as patterns of connections inside brains. But this has remained mainly hypothetical in spite of many decades of theoretical research of, of my famous colleagues in theoretical neuroscience. Why is that? Why have we not managed to really figure out how memories are stored? I would say that's because we're unable to observe, directly observe the key quantity in the theory, the connections. If you can't observe the connections, how can you test a theory that's based on connections? It's very difficult. The last area is that of psychiatric disorders. There are plenty of mental illnesses for which no clear and consistent neuropathology has ever been found. This was the case for schizophrenia. For 100 years, people have failed to find something abnormal about the brains of schizophrenics upon autopsy. Why is that? Well, one interesting possibility which has been conjectured about for an equally long time is that the neurons are healthy, but they're just connected in abnormal ways. And that could be, that's a very popular hypothesis about autism uh, and many other disorders. But we've never had the technologies to see that. And I would argue that if we invest some, some dollars and some effort in trying to develop those technologies, we would have a chance of finding these connectopathies, these pathological patterns of connections. So those are the three positions, uh, and they're outlined in public in my book. And I'm very curious to hear what Tony has to say, because I don't know exactly, I have no idea, actually, what his position is. So let's hear from Tony. 
this is a stealth, uh, a stealth approach to, uh, um, yeah, so, so um, the, uh, I also have three points that I want to make, but they're actually sort of arranged in an orthogonal way to the one Sebastian mentioned. Um, and the first thing I want to make clear is that like any rational scientist, I am not going to argue against the acquisition of knowledge. Okay? There's no way to win by arguing that you shouldn't go out and acquire knowledge. So the question of whether one should try to measure either a whole or a partial connectome is, as far as I'm concerned, off the table. Because in an, in an abstract world with infinite resources, there's no question that you want to try and measure every rational thing you can. Um, but it does seem to me that there are a number of things that suggest that the connectome is not the right tool with which to try and understand neural computation. And I was glad to hear Sebastian measure neural mention neural computation because that's actually, to me, the key central step uh, that we all need to try and grasp in order to understand how the nervous system works. Um, and there are a couple of things that seem to be worth mentioning. Um, one is the question of whether the connectome will actually inform us about the computations that the brain performs. Uh, we actually have a very clear example in front of us, Sebastian's book in fact begins with it, uh, which is the worm C. elegans, uh, whose connectome is very simple, relatively simple. It has 302 neurons and about 7,000 connections. And those connections have been wholly known for about 20 years. Uh, but I think it's fair to say, and some of the great experts in the behavior and physiology of the worm are sitting here, it's fair to say that our understanding of the worm has not been materially enhanced by having that connectome available to us. We don't have a comprehensive model of how the worm's nervous system actually produces the behaviors. What we have is uh, a sort of a bed on which we can build experiments, and many people have built many elegant experiments on that bed. But that connectome has not by itself explained anything. Um, there are, I think, three reasons why connectomes are not the, r the right way to go. I promised you three reasons in response to Sebastian's three, and I'll give them to you. The first, and maybe in some ways the most fundamental, is that there is a scale mismatch between the information that you get in a connectome, which is measured at the level of synapse to synapse, contact to contact, and the kind of description that you want to acquire of how the nervous system actually works. The interesting aspects of what the nervous system does, I think, take place at what you might call, if you were a physicist, a mesoscale level, not at the microscale level of individual connections. And I think you can argue that for many different purposes, it's sufficient to be able to describe the statistics on average of how nerve cells are connected without needing to know in detail exactly how each nerve cell is connected to each other. One of the great pioneers of connectomics is Jeff Lichtman, and Jeff has, among other things, studied the connections of a very small bundle of motor neurons to a very small bundle of muscle fibers in the mouse's ear. And he's made a great point of the fact that each mouse is unique and different in the way that those muscle fibers are contacted by the motor neuron that innervate them. So knowing the individual pattern of an individual mouse's connection actually doesn't tell you what you need to know. What you need to know is that the overall structure of the connections is of a statistical nature, the same across all mice. And that's what accounts for the behavior of the ear across all mice. The second point I would want to make is that although it's fundamental to biology that we understand structure and function in terms of one another, structure to function relationships don't actually work terribly well in the nervous system. Uh, and I think that's because unlike, let's say, the kidney, whose job is to process electrolytes, the nervous system is there to process information, and the kind of information that it is processing can't be defined in the same simple way as the electrolytes that the kidney processes. So the kidney is an organ that has a particular structure which lets it do its particular job, and that particular job is well defined from the moment of birth. The nervous system is by its nature adaptable and it can handle information of many different kinds. And therefore, what I think you would argue is that the structure of the nervous system constrains the kinds of operations that the nervous system can perform, but doesn't tell you any one in particular, what any one operation in particular is done. Um, and there's a particular point which I, well, I'm glad Sebastian mentioned because I think it's going to be an interesting one to pick up for discussion later, which is the question of memories and whether mem yeah. One more. The question of whether memories are encoded in the pattern of nerve cell connections. And I'll just leave that as a topic that I think will be fruitful for, for the third. And the third um, is, um, in many ways, the most obvious and the simplest to express. And that is that the structure of an information processing machine doesn't tell you about the computations it performs. And the analogy which we're imprisoned by is the current information processing machinery we use, digital computers. And digital computers have a form and an architecture which does not tell you anything about the programs that they run and the information that they process. 
process. So I can analyze in the finest detail the structure of a microprocessor, and it will tell me the kinds of computations that that processor can do, but it will not tell me the particular computations that it does. And David Marr is, of course, the great pioneer in thinking about that problem because he argued that we should separate the substrate for a computation, the basic biology, from the actual algorithm that's employed. Understanding algorithms and operating systems is what helps you understand computers. Understanding their wiring is not what actually is going to help you understand them. So those are the three points for me. Scale mismatch between the level of the connectome and the level of understanding you want to achieve. The relationship between structure and the function in the nervous system being somewhat elusive. And third, the relationship between computations and their substrate being elusive. Okay, that's the opening remarks. Carl, if you're ready, you can jump in. But I just want to make it clear for everybody that there is some of this that's going to go straight over your head, and our job is to make sure that we pluck it down from the air and bring it down into your lap, if at all possible. So we will do that from time to time. You want to start? Or? Well, uh, yeah, I would actually, I, I think a great place to start would be this worm, C. elegans. Um, uh, people who are not neuroscientists may not be intimately familiar with this vinegar worm, but this is this animal whose every little neuron has been parsed out and mapped out, and huge amounts of studies have been done in it. And we have a connectome, we've had it for a while, and yet we still don't really understand this worm very well. So uh, if, if the connectome is, is um, such a Rosetta Stone, then why don't we understand the worm? Well, I, I would first say that I'm embarrassed to speak about C. elegans because some of the greatest figures in C. elegans yeah, biology are, is in the are, are here. So, but I, from my conversations with the C. elegans community, everyone who does work on the nervous system does rely heavily on the C. elegans connectome. So there's no doubt in my mind that it's useful. Uh, and so here it's a question of whether something is sufficient. I think Tony is asking the question of whether the connectome is sufficient for uh, understanding the nervous system. And I would say that C. elegans is really a very different case from the mammalian nervous system. And the reason is that it has been very difficult to record the activity of C. elegans neurons. Almost impossible. Why? Uh, just simple technical reasons. It uh, it's, turns out to be difficult. I mean, first of all, any kind of neurophysiology experiment, sticking an electrode inside a cell to record its activity is a virtuoso feat, as someone like Tony well knows. And it just turns out, happenstance, that it's easier to do that in a mouse or a monkey or even a human than it is to do that in C. elegans. Really? So you're complaining about this little wiggly thing? It's just hard to get. <laughs> Huh. Well, data is sometimes hard to get. So I would is it say something that, about that, uh, that it has uh, different kinds of neurons. Is that it has, is its neurons are not the same? For example, their neuro the neurons don't spike. They don't produce. Most of them don't produce action potentials. So that makes it harder to measure from. But there's lots of differences. Okay, but you're, so you're saying that um, if we get a. a, a a connectome for a little peppercorn size of mouse brain, we're going to be able to do a lot more, a lot faster with it. Is that what you're saying? That's because the technologies for measuring activity in, in rodent or monkey brains are very well developed. The activity measurements already exist. All we have to do is supply the connections now, and that uh, immediately is useful to people. Okay, Tony, you're a mammal. What say you? Thank you. It's <laughs> the nicest thing anybody said to me all evening. Um, <laughs> So, so I'm glad that Sebastian raised the fact that you can't record activity in the worm well because in the most extreme and crystallized form of the connectome argument, it shouldn't actually matter that you can't record what the worm cells do because you should know what the worm does from the pattern of connections of its nervous system. Uh, it's in fact precisely uh, the key point for me that you must record the activity of cells in the nervous system and you must understand not particularly the cells and their connections but the signals that they transmit in order to understand how it's going. And to be fair, many who promote sort of connectomic approaches are aware that in order to understand the structure, you need to also make measurements of the function, which is in effect what Sebastian was saying a little while ago. But that in itself to me is an argument that the connectome alone, and there's going to be a sufficiency necessity kind of argument which will probably recur, Sebastian already alluded to it, the connectome alone only tells you what might happen in a piece of tissue. It doesn't tell you what does happen. But I would like to make, go one step further about the C. elegans analogy and, and why I think it's, not, it's a little bit misleading. So in C. elegans, there's 300 neurons, but each of those neurons has a name. 
It's exquisitely, it's, it's, uh, it has an individual character, it has a name, and it's probably been exquisitely adapted by evolution as an individual part of the C. elegans nervous system. So there are basically as many neurons, as many parts of the C. elegans ner nervous system as there are neurons. But in, in mammalian brains, which are composed of huge numbers of neurons, I would argue that there's, uh, in many cases, many neurons of the same type which are connected to each other then it's the organization of those parts that matter. So if I have a machine that's built of a, a thousand parts, each of which is different, knowing how the parts are organized is uh, less important than a machine that's built out of a thousand parts that are all the same, like a bunch of Lego blocks. So I think, I mean, I think that's the point on which we would agree, except that's what I was alluding to when I mentioned Jeff Lichtman's work about the connection from nerve to this muscle in the mouse. The point being that it's sufficient to have a statistical description of how this works on average across many mice. It's not necessary to know mouse to mouse, individual nerve fiber to individual nerve fiber, how the wiring is done. Well, do you, what do you think? He's saying, oh, if all the nerves are the same and they have the same name, over in the lucky world of the mammals, then all you do is you don't have to know about each and every one of them, just average the group's activity and you know a lot. So how do you obtain the statistical relationship unless you have the individuals? Well, there are many techniques that don't require you to measure every element of a system that give you good measurements of the average. When you mix a martini, you don't count molecules. You just measure the quantities of the ingredients. Well, I would say the brain is much more complex than a martini. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have a short evening. <laughs> Even though I might crave one right now, but... Uh... <laughs> well, how, I mean, are you, like, getting rid of counting? I mean, he likes the idea. It seems very fastidious and, and sort of sciencey. One, two, three, four, five, six. I know what they all are doing, and I see every one of them. And one is connected to six, and, and two one. is connected to four. Yeah, so I am, you I am, like fuzzy. I, I think. am a great admirer of counting. No one exceeds me in my admiration for counting. Uh, let me let me let me make a particular example for you because it's one that I'm fond of, and it's one that Sebastian has actually done some very elegant work on. And it is uh, probably the first mammalian structure whose connectome will pro will be worked out in detail, which is the mammalian retina. Okay, so the mammalian retina, as you may know is the receptive layer at the back of your eye. Uh, it is actually an extruded piece of brain, which happens by con for convenience reasons to be put in the back of the eye. It and, has, and how many neurons are there? Um, there are about 100 million photoreceptor neurons in the mammalian eye, in, in your eye, but that's kind of a misleading number because most of them just sort of carpet the retina. Um, think about a million signals passing out of the eye and think about you know, maybe five to 10 million neurons within the eye that are processing the information. The thing about the eye and the retina is we have a really good idea about what it's for. Uh, it's not for making decisions, it's not for mixing martinis, it's not for making movements, it's for seeing with. And we know what it is for seeing with because we know how images are formed on it by the optics of the eye. So we have a very precise notion about what particular pieces of the retina do. And for that reason, I think you can argue that the retina is a part of the brain about which we have perhaps the most advanced understanding of any. And our understanding of it is in terms of what we in my lab and in, among my colleagues often call a functional model, which is a description of how the light that falls onto the eye is transformed by circuits in the retina into a pattern of action potentials that leaves the eye and carries the visual signal into the brain. The functional descriptions that we have of retinal ganglion cells are extraordinarily accurate at this point, and they were created... When you call them functional, you're, you're, like you're talking about equations. You can, you can express them as equations if you want, but what I mean by functional is simply that if you give me a pattern of light, mm -hmm. I will tell you how the ganglion cell that I'm modeling will respond. And I can do that with a rather high degree of precision. In order to do that, I need a statistical description which is based on the properties of the average of ganglion cells of that type, and it's been acquired through many years of laborious work. I would contend, and I think, I hope Sebastian would disagree, because otherwise I'm not quite sure what he's doing in the retina, that knowing the connections of an individual ganglion cell, and knowing its particular architecture, and the way it connects to bipolar cells and photoreceptor cells and everything else, is actually not important to understanding what it does. The level at which we understand it now is the right level, and that's the functional level. So, Sebastian, I, I, I should say that I uh, written about Sebastian's work uh, in a column for Discover, and to, to do so, I went up to his lab, and there, I you know met some of your students who were uh, working on very beautiful uh, maps of the retina, a little connectome, and um, so this is this is where you are. You're you're doing a connectome in the retina where 
He so says, we'll talk. Yeah, so, so Tony's referring to this, I think, because uh, we are working on the retina. So what are you finding you, with a connectome in my eye that you wouldn't find? All right. So Tony is giving uh, what I would call the textbook description of how the retina works, which is that the gang retinal ganglion cells, they're the output cells of the eye, they work like a linear filter. They take the image and they enhance the contrast and they send that enhanced image along to the, uh, all the way to the brain. Now, the retinal community doesn't think about the retina that way anymore, actually. It's very, and, and I think Marcus Meister is one of the notable uh, uh, op, um, sort of heretics in that field. He's broken away from, from the simple filter idea of the retina and there's much more of a recognition of diversity in the responses of retinal cells. If you look at uh, ganglion cells, they don't look the same as each other. If you look at their tree-like shapes, there's a tremendous diversity. You can classify that. A man named Dick Masland has pioneered the classifications of these ganglion cells into different types. And each of those types of ganglion cells performs a distinct computation. At least that's the hypothesis, and there's some evidence for that. Each of those ganglion cells is performing a distinct computation in the retina, and a lot of times it's far from this linear filtering kind of computation that Tony is referring to. So I think that declaring triumph in the retina is really uh, an outmoded way of thinking about the retina. That's not the way, that's the way that the people who studied the which, cortex. Which side, the people, you, which side are you on? Because like a minute ago, you were saying that there's large hunks of us that have neurons that are doing the same thing. Now here's the area you know, and it suddenly turned into the bar in Star Wars. Everything's a little different. <laughs> so, what a... Uh, what do you think? I mean, well, so let, let, let me help Sebastian okay. here. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I, I, Sebastian would probably uh, agree that all areas of the mammalian brain have great diversity of cell types. One of the huge problems in connectomics and in neuroscience generally is to understand how all those cell types connect. The model of the retina I was referring to, though, was not the simple linear filter model of, of 30 years ago. Uh, there are much more sophisticated functional models. And in fact, the discovery of multiple cell types within the retina by people like Dick Masland and Dennis Stacy and others has been accompanied by detailed analyses of their function. And there are people who are developing functional models, not linear ones, but complex ones, for each each of these functional classes. The basic point of, of, of polar difference between us remains the question of whether it is sufficient to acquire an average description of the behavior of the class, linear or nonlinear, complex or simple, or whether it's necessary to map the connections of each individual element in order to understand what the retina does. So let me just address Bob's question, and you're, you're quite right to pick up on that. I, I say that the retina is like the invertebrate inside our vertebrate nervous system. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not as, as stereotyped as the C. elegans, but there still is a lot of stereotypy. It's probably largely genetically hardwired, uh, the way that, that it's connected. So indeed, there's a certain similarity to C. elegans. But the advantage, of course, is that physiologists can record uh, the activity of all these different kinds of neurons. And I would say that the, the uh, the models that Tony is, is uh, the models that Tony refers to are really uh, putting nonlinearity in in a not very essential way, right? They're linear nonlinear models. They have a little nonlinearity at the end. It, still, visual neuro, neuroscientists have a big difficulty in coping with uh, nonlinear models and finding the right stimuli with which to probe uh, cells. So I think that some kind of constraints from the way that, that uh, neurons are really kind of connected in the retina as opposed to made up kinds of functional forms would be very helpful to visual neuroscience. So, maybe, maybe, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to suggest uh, that maybe we shift from the retina to another issue you brought up, which is memory. Uh, give us, just sort of remind us what people have um, believed memory okay. to be, how it works, and but what the connectome I is I think going before we move on yeah. to memory, we have to address Tony's punches. We have to, we have to, we have to, have we addressed all of Tony's criticisms yet? Uh, You're asking I think, me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we've only, we've only no, dealt think, with one of them. I think we're going to be able to by talking specifically about memory. Well, okay. we, don't, we definitely want to stay away from the geeky territory of nonlinear models of retina. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think Absolutely. that's what our moderator sent. But I think, I think the, retina, the retina is a place that's worth considering in this context because uh, it has great diversity and it also has great regularity. And I think that the retinal physiologists in the room, if there were any, might be offended at the notion that this was the invertebrate part of the mammalian eye. <laughs> 
mean, that retinal community is just a uh, wild. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just scary people. You know, no, but know okay, so it's very, it, okay, so it's very, it's very geeky, but uh, to talk <laughs> about visual neuroscience, but this really is a, a central area. Your, your area of visual neuroscience is a central intellectual discipline, I think, in neuroscience as a whole. To, to a large extent, what we've learned in the visual system has tremendous influence on the way that we think about computation in the rest of the brain. And I'm sorry if it sounds really geeky. We care about it passionately because it's been historically important. So here's the way I would characterize this, this, the visual neuroscience. I would say that on the one hand, we have linear filter models, right? Simple what? linear filter models simply Basically, uh, a neuron takes one part of the image, adds that up, takes another part of the image, subtracts that, and, and takes the difference. Simple kinds of computations like that, just adding and subtracting image pixels to give you the output. Now, the other extreme we have, uh, something that, that Robert wrote brilliantly about this weekend, which is the Jennifer Aniston neuron. <laughs> you guys have heard about that? So you. You have a neuron? I have a lot of <laughs> You have a lot of, you, have a, <laughs> you guys should read his work. It's really good. It's really good. The Jennifer Aniston neuron was a famous neuron discovered in a human patient by Itzhak Fried, a neurosurgeon. And he showed, it, he showed this person pictures, many different pictures of celebrities, places, um, landmarks, uh, non-famous people, and so on. And he, he discovered one neuron that was activated only by pictures of Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Right? The, the tabloids loved it, right? Scientists discover the part of the brain that helps you remember useless things. <laughs> so, but this is really uh, goes back to, and, and of course there's subtleties. It, you know, there's disclaimers about the fact that it, this neuron only recognizes Jennifer Aniston. But that, let's put that in the footnote for now. So this is an old idea also in visual neuroscience of the, of the feature detector, of a neuron that responds if and only if it sees one particular stimulus. That's extremely nonlinear, highly nonlinear. You can't, can't, can't implement that with simply adding and subtracting image pixels. And the difficulty we have in visual neuroscience is that we can deal with one extreme or the other extreme, but we have difficulty making compelling models of what neurons do between those two extremes. And most of the visual system is between those two extremes. That's why we want to talk about this other thing. We want to talk about, people have wondered, since pretty much since Eric Kandel sort of deciphered this, but people have wondered, like, how does the memory form? So we have a, we have a model, and I, in your book you say, well, this is a way, really for the first time, to test whether that model is true for us. So could you explain that? And then we'll find out whether he agrees. I, I, I still have to disagree about Jennifer, but we'll do that later. <laughs> <laughs> you want to disagree about Jennifer? Anderson? Yes, because I'll simply make the, I'll make the point, Chris. Um, but what, what Sebastian refers to in his book is the weighted voting model of neurons, where they combine their inputs and decide whether to fire or not. doesn't merely add up the pixels. It also applies some very important nonlinear computations. And you can, in fact, model Jennifer Aniston cells with relatively simple, mostly linear feedforward networks, if you wish. So I'm not sure that Jennifer Aniston is quite so decisive a refutation of that whole style of work as you might have had the impression. So Jennifer Aniston and the retinal community have had, I think, enough mention here. So let's. Yeah. <laughs> but we like Jennifer Aniston. Know, in the who community. doesn't okay. like Jennifer Aniston? <laughs> Sorry. So <laughs> I'm asking you about about what you think. A connectome will add, if anything, to our understanding of how we form memories. Right, so the reigning theory in neuroscience is that, well, so let's just back up. Let's talk about the facts. We know that connections between neurons can be modified by experiences. So when you have an experience and it causes neurons to become active, that activity, activity of two neurons can lead to the strengthening of the connection between them. That's called Hebb's rule after a Canadian psychologist named Donald Hebb who wrote in 1949. Now, this theory was developed by generations of theoretical neuroscientists, people who wrote down equations, neural network models of how memories are stored. And the basic idea goes like this. So let's say, um, let's say uh, we see uh, I guess in my book I use the example of the, fir of the first kiss. So let's say this first kiss, it's this memory that's embedded in your mind. How is it stored? Well, if we imagine the first kiss to be a combination of many different perceptions, uh, let's say that it happened not by happenstance but in a very romantic situation, uh, candlelit dinner, 
I mean, usually it doesn't happen that way, right? Usually <laughs> it's clumsy and whatever. But suppose it happened in a very planned way with a, a candlelit dinner, and let's say that, that you had a filet mignon and your date had uh, uh, chicken and so on. There's the clothes the person was wearing and so on and so forth. Now, let's imagine that for each of those stimuli, there's some, s some small set of neurons that's active in your brain. So the theory of Donald Hebb was that when all those neurons are activated together, the connections between them get strengthened. Now, why would that be a memory? Well, suppose later on in the future you happen to come back to the same restaurant where you had your first kiss. The neurons that are part of that memory get activated, and because they're connected to all the other neurons corresponding to the other stimuli, those neurons get activated, and so the whole experience comes flooding back to you. From just a partial stimulus, you get all the stimuli being uh, evoked in your brain by the activation of this highly interconnected group of neurons, which Hebb called the cell assembly. This theory has been around since 1949. It's been mathematized and formulated, reformulated and calculated to death and simulated, and yet we still have no idea really whether it's correct. We have only indirect evidence. And so this is a, a, an example of the problem that we have in theoretical neuroscience, which is that our theories, and I, I used to spend all of my time thinking of such theories, our theories can take an extraordinarily long time to test. So that my joke is that, is that originally I studied theoretical physics, and I quit theoretical physics because I felt like we couldn't test it empirically. And then when I got to neuroscience, it was out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> And Tony? But well, wait, I, I think we're missing something here. Yeah. So, okay, what's the connectome going to yeah. do? Oh, well, with the connectome. <laughs> that was going to be we're my not question. Gonna get the one two punch. The one two punch. <laughs> we're not going to let you get away so easy. <laughs> so, uh, so, if a memory really is stored as this as assembly of, of t highly interconnected neurons, the most direct way of going after that is to find a connectome and look for these sets of highly interconnected neurons. It's a how, direct test. How long will it take for you to find the candlelight dinner, the sirloin steak, the lips approaching, and <laughs> everything else? Like how many years of, how many neurons will you have to count before you can make an assembly that says, yep, I see that kiss over here, 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 and here. <laughs> well, we would start with, I think we would start with simpler cases than your romance. Ah. So one of the, the examples I propose in my book is to study the bird's memory of its song. So when uh, there's many neuroscientists who've done beautiful work on how a bird sings, and it turns out that neurons in a particular area of that bird's brain are activated in a very precise sequence. As you might imagine, right, if, if there's a, some sequence of notes that's repeated each time, it only stands to reason there's some sequence of neurons that gets activated each time. And the obvious hypothesis is that the first neurons have connections onto the second neurons, which have connections onto the third neurons. And so that's how you can get this activation uh, in sequence. Tony, the so go look for that. The, the, the issue is that the connectome is the route by which we will test this question of how memories are formed, whether it's birdsong or first kiss. And he's a little unclear about just how long it will take, but is it going, could you look at a brain one day with a connectome and see a kiss or a bird well, song or whatever. So I think you have to argue that it's a long shot. Um, actually, Sebastian has, in a less shy moment, said something like 40 years for the connectome that would be required to find the first kiss, assuming you didn't actually know where in the human brain it was and you had to map the whole structure. But 40 years is, you know, a drop in the bucket by the standards of the history of science. So let's set the time aside and ask whether, in principle, we think there's a reasonable shot of finding the first kiss in the connectome. So Sebastian did this very nice job of explaining how connected assemblies of cells by a sort of resonant pattern of activation could encode or recreate the experience of some past event. Um, and this, this thing he described is something that, that uh, was that psychologists called the engram when they first went looking for it. It's the place where the memory is laid down. And one of the strongest hypotheses about how the memory is laid down that's out there is one that says that the memory is laid down by changing the pattern of connections between nerve cells. And if that hypothesis is true, 
true, then Sebastian in the last chapters of his book can, can, can get lyrical about the possibility of actually decoding memories from the structure of the nervous system. Uh, the problem is that I think the evidence that that is true is hard to come by. Uh, there is evidence that structures change in the nervous system. Sebastian's already alluded to that. There's evidence that some structures change in the presence of changes associated with memory, but there's no good evidence in most cases that those are causal changes. And there are actually some very elegant ideas. A colleague of mine drew my attention the other day to a, a, a sort of half-page paper by Francis Crick from the 1980s in which Crick pointed out that you could make a little molecular switch inside of a cell which would allow a cell to strengthen or, or basically enhance a connection without changing its appearance in any way. And in fact, there's more modern work by, by people uh, in actually some in the city. Todd Sachter has done work on this. On an, there are molecular structures within cells, which at this stage are not yet proven, but could be the molecular switches that underlie memories. And for a variety of reasons, it's always seemed to me an expensive way to lay down a memory by actually building a new connection between two cells if all you need is basically a volume control in the chemistry of the cell would allow you to turn it up or turn it down. And you wouldn't see that. And you would not see that in the connectome. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> if one of the central questions we'd like to know is what is a memory and how do they form, and you're saying, oh, I don't know, could be the way that we thought, could be that way or some other way. Well, to be fair, Sebastian... Sebastian offered the connectome as a test of that hypothesis. Yes. It's a rather elaborate test, but it indeed is a test. No, no. <laughs> As if the rest of neuroscience were not elaborate? <laughs> Are you saying that for, for there, I mean, I don't, uh, do we, need, he has a question that he'd like to put to the test. You don't seem to have, you think, well, I don't know, it could be this, it could be that, it could be the other. So what are you going to do about it? You're an explorer, this is the mind. What would you like to do? If you don't want to build a thing like he wants to build, what do you got? So th th there's, a, there's a danger there, okay? That way lies madness, okay? Because follow the line of reasoning that you just articulated, and that leads you to um, giga science. The idea that you have to have a grand project with a grand theme in order to make progress with a grand problem, okay? And we are faced actually with several examples of that uh, in neuroscience right now. Um, such, the, as. such as the full connectome, which Sebastian has, you know, has, has been a, a proponent of, although he understands the limitations, such as the Blue Brain Project, which yeah. some of you may have encountered, which I'll describe in a second, which is a big computational project, which is related to the connectome, but is an attempt to uh, provide a description of brain function in terms of a highly detailed functional simulation of a bunch of nerve cells based on cells from the mouse cerebral cortex. Um, these, these are worthy enterprises, and I'm going to, you know, I will remind you what I said at the beginning. I'm not against acquiring knowledge, okay? It's a bad thing to be against acquiring knowledge. The question is whether the resources that you have should be best applied to acquiring that particular kind of knowledge or whether they should be targeted to uh, more specific, more guided, more hypothesis-driven, more focused experiments. Um, in my world, and maybe it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's an antique world, but in my world, neuroscience is basically a cottage industry. Okay? Small groups of people tackle small problems with sets of techniques that they basically command on their own. They collaborate with the people down the hall if they have other techniques that they need. We are not a discipline that goes for big recipe-driven science, and I think that's what makes our field as interesting and entertaining as it is. And so the, the problem that Bob raises, now he got more of an answer than he deserved or perhaps expected no, to that question, no. but the, the problem of grandeur in neuroscience is one which I think many of us are concerned about these days because there's always a seductive attempt to build the biggest collide to build the highest rocket, to build the biggest uh, computer. And those projects are often not as well motivated as you would want. Let me turn the tables on you. If, let's suppose there's someone in here who's 27 years old, wants to make a career in brain science, is young, and has all kinds of ideas. And you come out with this enormous banner called Connecto, and, and you win. So the jobs in departments all over America go to connectomists, and the money in the salaries go to connectomists, and connectomists follow connectomists, and, and this guy's just interested in, I don't know, rattlesnake dreams or something. <laughs> so, so he doesn't have a shot at a job, and it turns out that sometimes, if it's a cottage industry, that sometimes the real smarties are the mavericks, the ambitious ones. What? happens if we all have to march for, th if you're 27 and the generation is told, okay, here's what we're going to do for you guys, 30 years counting neurons. Who wants to sign up? <laughs> 
maybe that's not a, an, an interesting job anymore. Well, I have, I have several responses to the, these uh, comments. So one of them is simply, if you look at the analogy of genomics, it's true that there was a big human genome project, but once you have that information, a thousand flowers bloom. All those cottages are making use of genomic information. It's enhancing the lives of many individual scientists. So that's... Well, but at the time, there was a huge debate about the, whether to go forward with a $3 billion 10-year human genome project. I mean, we, we can do it in an afternoon now, right. but back then, it took a huge amount of time. And I think that the connectome is kind of at that point. Sure. I mean, why not, why not wait, why don't you wait until you're retired <laughs> and, you have, and you have enormous computers and you can just sit down one afternoon and go and bam, you've got your connectome. And it's something you can do to pass the time as opposed to <laughs> taking over the entire neuroscience uh, community. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that all neuroscience funding be directed towards connectomes, but in fact, Thank goodness. I, would argue, I would argue it's quite the other Some way are. around. There is very little support, I, I find, within neuroscience, very little support for research on technologies that doesn't have a very immediate payoff. I think, that, I think that neuroscientists are very short-sighted. They're, they're thinking about as far as their next paper or their next grant, and they'll use whatever technology that exists right now. But there's nobody thinking about what technology is really going to get the whole field farther in five years or ten years. And I think that some amount of money should be put towards that. I'm not saying it should be you know, so huge that it takes away from the rest of neuroscience, but still, some significant amount of money and some, more than money, I think talent that people have to be motivated by this idea. Uh, and it's, it's going to bring a different kinds of talent than we normally have in neuroscience. It's a different kind of job. Now, the second thing I would point out uh, is, so Tony brings up this, this question of grandeur, right? So, and and he, he brings up the, advantage, the example of Blue Brain. Blue Brain is this project of Henry Markram, who is a neuroscientist who's full of grandeur. <laughs> Because he wants to, he claims that he's going to simulate an entire human brain within 10 years. He said that in, in, in uh, I think, two years ago, something like that. 2007? All right, so that's a very grandiose kind of proclamation. Uh, and, and I think that Tony is very subtly trying to put me in the same class as Henry Markram. No, no. <laughs> So, in so many ways not. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just easy. But uh, so I would point out the following: the goal of mapping neural connections is, in some sense, not grandiose. The goal of simulating an entire human brain is grandiose. The goal of I want to understand the brain is extremely grandiose. But hey, I just want to map some connections. <laughs> That's so much to add. That is so trivial. It's, it's trivial that we can actually evaluate the progress quantitatively. Unlike, I would like to understand the brain, which... Excuse which, me, the bill for this is going to be like tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. The recruitment will be elaborate. The intention paid will be a lot. I mean, you, so, yeah, I mean, let's talk about... But, I, but the point is that the goals are, in some sense, trivial. See, the thing about I want to understand the brain is it's, people don't even agree on what that means. <laughs> I want to simulate the brain. What does that mean? How would you know when you succeeded? But mapping the connectome is measurable. Progress is measurable. And we can say next year will be twice as good as we were last year. And the year after that will be twice as good again. And it's just going to get better and better. Tony, I'm just wondering where your grandiose lies. It's in your back pocket somewhere, I guess. But is, <laughs> can you give a, can you paint the, well, you're a modest guy, but you have to recruit. Like, there will be people in this room who are thinking, shall I go into brain science? He's saying, if you come with me on this connectome trip, I'm going to let you look into brains. You're going to see thoughts. I'm going to, I'm going to take your whole brain and put it in a frozen... But there's a whole, at the end of his book, he's like, he makes you immortal. I mean, he's got... <laughs> He's got a lot to say. What, what do you have to offer in the way... I know you're modest, but you, let, do a little... What's your recruiting speech? Because it sounds like you're just going to sit there and wait for, for Joe over there and Sally over here to come up with... A, in the cottage industry, to come up with a cool discovery, and we'll all explain then. That's the plan. It's That's just, pretty much it. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> and you know what? It's worked okay for me. <laughs> you know? it's, it's not a bad life. No, I mean, look, the... the, the, uh, the 
there are, there are many different levels of answers, but I mean, I, it, is, it is not my way, and I think it's not the way of many in neuroscience. Sebastian is right. Neuroscience is not sympathetic to things that have long vision and long reach and no immediate payoff. Like most people, we're motivated by relatively immediate rewards and goals that we can see and articulate. And it's an entirely fair point that the structure of rewards in our field biases us against doing things that have long range. Um, it's also dangerous um, to... to, 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 to um, a, sort of put yourself in the position of being the discriminated against by that particular rule. So I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't phrase that well, but 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 I, I find it hard. I mean, I, Sebastian doesn't do a good victim for me. The, 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 <laughs> the gold sneakers just don't go with the victim persona. And I think that the particular progress of the connectome and the amount of attention that's being paid to it shows that it is actually a very appealing uh, and very important piece of modern neuroscience, which is attracting a lot of attention and money and talent. There's There are connectomes of many different levels. One of the things that we might touch on if we have time is the fact that there are actually several other sort of forms of connectome science which are being done, uh, some of which are... Um, in my view, much more likely to bear immediate fruit. And so there are many different ways in which resources are being invested in the connectome. We did invest, as you pointed out, the X billion dollars in the genome. And although all of those little cottages are indeed using genome uh, technologies, or many of them are, the fact is that if you go back to 2000 and find out what we were promised uh, that we would have when the genome was complete, we didn't kind of get that, okay? There's like all this stuff that sort of didn't quite get worked out. Other good things happened, no question. And there's no doubt that if you did the connectome, other unexpected good things would happen. Um, but I suspect that Sebastian will probably not be in cryogenic state at the end of the connectome. I'm sorry, I just, you know, I can't see that. Right, let, let me, before I give it to the audience, let me just ask you a, a last question. If you're both of you, what is the worst thing that the other, what is the thing that the, the other guy's <laughs> argument that you most irritated by or scared of? <laughs> Either one. <laughs> I, I have no arguments with what Sebastian. You have no arguments with him. No, right, look, it, 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 we, look, we are, we are uh, here's, here's something really lame to end this with. We are both seekers after a particular kind of truth, okay? We each believe that we know something about a path to acquire a truth about a structure that we care about a lot, okay? Uh, and we read each other's work, or at least I read Sebastian's, and there's some hint that he reads mine. And we, we care about learning the same things about the same structure. Um, we are not all marching in lockstep. Neuroscientists don't do that. And so some of us are going to learn more and some are going to learn less. Um, what this is an argument about is nuance and scales of gray and approaches to large questions. Uh, it's not an argument about good and evil, and it's not an argument about what gets up the other person's nose. I'm sure I said some things that got up Sebastian's nose, but he's only going to tell me that later over the martini that we're going to mix. Oh, come on. <laughs> tell us now. I don't know what got up. Okay, no, you, you, I wouldn't say anything annoyed me, but I didn't agree with the comparison to the computer. I think the digital computer is a false analogy for the brain. The idea that you can, for a computer, you, and, and, I, and, I, and I, okay, I should say David Marr, that is a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> because I come from MIT and the ghost of David Marr still haunts the, haunts the corridors. Phil, David Marr, we don't have to study so Sebastian. I'll, 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 Phil, listen. Who's, who's David, Marr? So da David David Marr, I mentioned David Marr earlier. David Marr is the guy, he was, a com he was a computational scientist who analyzed the visual system. And he articulated in a very elegant book in the early 80s um, that um, really told people who think about the visual system in biological terms to separate their thoughts about the biology from their thoughts about the computation. Uh, he wanted you to think about the algorithm and the implementation as two different problems. And for a connectionist, that's really anathema. Because if you believe that the connection is the computation, then what Mara is saying is that is absolutely wrong. The connection and the computation are separate. You can, that's why ign you can ignore the connectome. And that's why Seb Sebastian doesn't like the computer analogy, because he would argue that the brain is not a general purpose computer that can be programmed to do any old different things. It's a special purpose computer that evolved over billions of years to do particular jobs that basically involve mating with one another. Um, and all the rest, the first kiss was not an accident. It's an accident you know? And so, the, and, and, and this is an argument which, you know, even, even proponents of Marr will, will, will entertain to some level because Marr had a very extreme and very particular view on this. That's right. David Marr actually was a very a uh, famous theoretical neuroscientist. He was one of the theorists who made neural network models following up on the ideas of Donald Hebb. But he quit theoretical neuroscience in disgust. At least that's the way that I read his papers. So he had, he had, he had several highly 
uh, in influential papers in the late seven, in the late sixties, and then he turned to computer vision, and then he he uh, laid out this manifesto of Mars three levels, where he talked about the computational problem, the algorithm, and the implementation, and he said we don't have to study the implementation. And I think in many ways you can compare him to the behaviorists who said we don't have to study the brain or the mind. We only study behavior. That was a healthy thing to do. When, when you can't observe something, declare it off limits. Declare it a virtue not to look at it. But Mars, Mars influence and Mars perspective is totally outmoded today. Unfortunately, my department at MIT still seems to adhere to it a lot. But it's totally outmoded because times have changed. And if Mar were alive today, he would not say those things. So I would, it's I, like you can walk into a room, you don't know anything, and you end up be able to walk out hating David Marr. <laughs> I mean, but, but, but never so, even heard of. But so, if, you know, hate, hating David Marr has several disadvantages, not least that he sadly died a number of years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but if I you guess. Have, if, if you want. <laughs> If you want somebody, if you want somebody to hate in modern guys who will make these arguments in modern terms, uh, my colleague Matteo Carandini just actually last week had a paper in Nature Neuroscience in which he argues that the Mar principle of understanding the computation that the system performs is the level of analysis you need to investigate between the level of the circuit and the level of behavior. So if we're trying to understand how neural circuits lead to behavior, right, the question is whether we can basically make the leap from the circuit to the behavior, and Matteo argues, I think rather eloquently in this paper, that you cannot, that you need to understand the computation, and he furthermore argues that there are a number of sort of motifs of standard computation that the brain repeats over and over again, sort of systematic little approaches that it uses. And his argument is that the circuit elements that make those computations can be quite different, but the basic computational structure is the same. It's sort of Mar rewritten in modern terms. Okay, this is enough of Mar. I think yeah, you got that. <laughs> we are ready for your... You, you want to say something? Because we should look no, at questions. Yeah, questions? Now questions. here's what's going to... Uh, Becky's... Uh, Becky's going to... Ah, has the them. microphone. So Great. if you put up your hand, she'll just thrust the microphone in your general direction. If she can't, uh, then maybe we could, let's just try this for a second and see whether it works. And if it takes too long, then you'll just shout them out. And, and we're also going to be perhaps getting some questions from, from outer space. people who have been watching on the live stream on the Radio Lab website. We can always repeat questions. Like yeah, right. and we can repeat, repeat the questions. All right, so <laughs> person work? holding microphone goes now. Good. Uh, can you talk about some of the problems you were trying to solve? I know Sebastian was talking about schizophrenia, depression, PTSD. Um, it seems like a lot of the discussion was about how to understand how things work, but what are the big reasons why we should understand these connections and the connect all the discussion we've had thus far. So the question is, what have you been doing lately that we really care about? <laughs> The, these connectopathies connect you talked about, the, the diseases of the connectome. Like, explain that some more. Uh, so should I just, okay, so yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, you just answer. Yeah. Well, I'm an amateur in this area, so I can uh, tell you simply what, we, what I think the big challenges are and what we're planning. So the big excitement in the study of, so let's just distinguish between neurodegenerative disorders and developmental disorders. So neurodegeneration is, uh, includes Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, where neurons degenerate and die. Clearly, there's something wrong with the brain. But in developmental disorders, the idea is that the brain has developed in an abnormal way uh, and typically, in, 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 in some cases, we can see the, the abnormality. There's some really gross abnormalities, such as microcephaly, lysencephaly, where if you look at the brain, the uh, brain is extremely small, uh, the layers of the, of the cortex are inverted, so genetic defects typically have led to gross abnormalities in the brain. Now, there, there are other developmental disorders like autism and schizophrenia, they're thought to be developmental. There's a lot of excitement because genetic abnormalities associated with these disorders have been found. Uh, but to my mind, the most puzzling thing is still the lack of a neuropathology. If you look at the brains, if you do, a, if you do an autopsy of somebody who had schizophrenia, you can't find a clear and consistent pathology that is indicative of that disorder. Right? You can find average, sort of average case things. Maybe on average the ventricle is larger but for a single person, you, uh, there's population differences, but for a single person, there's no clear and consistent pathology. And this has been a, a terrible thing. We say they're brain disorders, and yet we don't see what's wrong with the brain. 
Is and there a hunch that, that you will one day see something that is consistently abnormal in some way? Well, that's, the, that's not my, my hypothesis, but there's plenty of people who have published theoretical papers arguing that maybe the neurons are healthy, they're just wired in a different way. And we can't detect that. We haven't been able to detect that with our technologies. And I guess the, the other thing to add, which would be sort of a compatible but alternate view of what's going on, is to say that these are disorders of neural computation. That you, in, in these diseases, you have circuits that are qualitatively normal, they appear normal, and yet the outcome of what they compute is not normal, and the outcome of what they compute is behavior, which is abnormal. Now, whether the foundations for the abnormalities of computation or abnormalities of circuitry are, is basically the point on which Sebastian and I part ways. So, so you don't think that's no, I, how it'll I, turn out? I, I think, I think um, the, the evidence that these are connectopathies okay, is not as clear as the evidence that they're abnormalities of neural computation. The connectopathy might be a lower level account, but it might not be the relevant account. Next. Uh, we now rise up uh, to you. Yes, again. I just wanted to open up the memory discussion again because it got sort of short shrift. Um, and uh, I, th I hope both of you would clarify your positions because it sounded to me talking about engrams that the whole idea of reconsolidation of memory, uh, the consolidation of memory through emotion, that this was not part of your discussion. I mean, memory is dynamic. We do not have an original memory. So I just thought if you could elaborate, elaborate somewhat on your memory positions. The question is, can you review, go back and tell us your definition of what a memory is, your best guess? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I will start by declaring that I am most notably not expert in memory, and particularly not expert in memory in a room filled with memory experts. But <laughs> having, having, having stipulated that, um, what I will say is that it, it seems to me that we know um, at the level of discussion that Sebastian and I were having, which has to do with the precise pattern of connections that presume, presumably stores and encodes memories, we don't know what the fundamental mechanism is, and in particular we don't know whether memories are sometimes, always, or never associated with structural changes that you can measure with a pattern of connections. And that would apply to fresh memories, reconsolidated memories, working memories, long-term memories. Those questions are open in all those areas. There's a great deal of evidence on this, and it's much better known to many people in this room than it is known to me. But if the conjecture is that the memories are always and inescapably encoded in patterns of visible connectional change, then I think the evidence for that is lacking. Lacking. I guess, yeah, let's try, yeah. So, to, um, to that statement. Um, this was published about a year and a half ago where there's a micro deletion uh, in a particular chromosome. It consists of several base pairs, then they, they're simply not there. And when that um, micro deletion is present, if you will, uh, there's a bundle of fibers connecting distal whoa, whoa, brain whoa, 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 areas whoa. that's... We, we know that a lot of you people know a lot, but you have to ask him a question. I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and there's a love question too, the first kiss question too coming. But So the question is, how is that not evidence that a genetic expression or lack of expression of a certain portion of neural tissue isn't evidence for uh, a connectome uh, abnormality that has symptoms because this bundle of fibers, its absence is associated with symptoms ranging from autism-like symptoms to uh, other types of uh, what might be called brain disorders or behavioral anomalies. So that's part one. Uh, I, I was making a much more compact point, which was uh, the, qu the question is not whether there are sometimes associations between structural and No, it's to the lack of evidence that you cited. And what, I, what I said there was lack of evidence for was that there was an unalterable and inevitable relationship between structural change and memory formation. You can show me a case where there is a, such a relationship. That doesn't show that it's always true. It shows that it's true in that case. That's what I meant. I, we have room for time for three more questions, and I, it, could we, maybe, I, can you, Becky, can you go all the way up to his, are you maybe Mr. Blue Shirt? Yeah, Why don't you? Yeah, um, I was really struck when you talked about the difference between the vertebrate, the vertebrate cells, and uh, I wanted you to sort of distinguish that again. Um, uh, yeah, just, she, the guy in the back says he was kind of curious that, that, that worms seem to have different kind of cells than mammals, and he was wondering about that distinction. Like what? Well, it, it's retinal. Oh, retinal. For retinal cells, he said they were more. Uh, <laughs> 
that retinal cells are somehow more invertebrate. He wonders whether you could enlarge it's, on that. It's kind of a joke. They, many of them don't have, it's, a, it's an insider's joke. Humor. It's an insider's joke. But there, 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 there is a kind of a simple form in which what Sebastian said is true. Our understanding of nerve cells is that when they transmit information over short distances, a small fraction of a millimeter, they don't need to make spikes in order to do that. And when they transmit information over large distances, they do. So if you're a worm and you're you know, a fraction of a millimeter long, you don't need spikes. And if you're a retina and you're only propagating information over a tiny fraction of a millimeter, you don't need to spike. And that's so, when they laugh. After they say that, they go, <laughs> <laughs> So from, from the, 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 the clouds of the internet. Yeah. Right? So from the ether web, uh, Lord and Nick, where there's been a uh, likely debate ongoing paralleling uh, this likely Who's winning? <laughs> Who's winning? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, there's a microphone. Okay, thank you. Okay, so from Laura and Nick, for the ultimate goal of neuroscience, um, whatever that is, a uh, hundred years or more from now, will we need at some point to have a connectome in hand? Okay, the long view. This is for you, yeah. Tony. At some point, whenever, could you think that a, a connectome would be, I believe he said, necessary? Yeah? Yeah, necessary. So I'm going to say I don't know. Um, uh, a hundred years. Don't know. Don't know because I don't know. I'm, my, my belief at this point, as I've expressed it, is that a statistical description is sufficient for all of the questions that I think we need to answer now. But I don't know what questions we would so be the, asking I mean, in a hundred years. Statistical things would be like, this particular kind of neuron has, on average, a certain number of we connections. We have so many types. They connect in so many ways to so many other types. Your typical I neuron mean, kind of thing. It's, it's, I think, an interesting and open question as to whether you're going to need the specific connections of each individual cell. And that's, you know, Sebastian's already on paper with that. You, so his answer is no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would argue as soon as we have that information, it will be viewed as essential. Last question of the night, I guess. Let's say how. I'm sorry. To, yeah. How about Miss Miss Blue Shirt? You have a thing about blue shirts. <laughs> I, I know. I wore yellow. So. Your analogy with the human genome has been really interesting, but I think one of the things that kind of doesn't fall in line is that with the human genome, there was a limit at which the amount of information stopped, right? So as soon as we learned that like C to be connected to G, A to T, like there was no more information to be gleaned beyond that. My question is, so we can keep going beyond the connectome. How many spines? What are the number of molecules being transmitted? Et cetera, et cetera. Where do we stop with the connectome? Question is, the genome had an alphabet. It just had four letters. You learned those. You kind of knew what you got. Three, three billion bases. You're done. You're done. Well, that's that's it, with the but that's not true. So with the, Craig Venter. So okay. So that's that. First of all, that's not true. So the first thing after doing the human genome is to do mo is to do other animals, of course, but also many human genomes, right? Because all of us have variations in our genetic sequences, and those variations are being mapped out right now by more and more advanced technologies of uh, gene sequencing. So that's the genomics is alive and well. And beyond that, there's epigenetic changes that people are trying to map out. So there's just more and more information that you can get out. Now, in the, in the case of the connectome, the problem of variability, of course, is much greater than it's going to be in the genome. So that's a huge technological challenge. Uh, and indeed, the question of how much extra information we need, and people are working on that, uh, remains to be seen. It's going to be a trial and error kind of thing. What can we explain with the information that we have? So I, nobody knows yet. Actually, so, so that's in, in some ways the fundamental question about the connectome um, business because although we didn't, we didn't go into it, there are many different versions of the connectome that basically vary in their spatial resolution. So there are some who argue you can do a very crude connectome just at the level, at the level of millimeters of tissue. Others, there's a project at Cold Spring Harbor which is basically 50 micron chunks of tissue. Um, and we don't, I think, know at this point which will be the most productive form of connection map. Um, Sebastian's bet is on the synaptic level, but your bet would be on, you know, the subcellular organelle level, perhaps, or on the groups of neurons level. Um, the, the, the particular connectome that Sebastian advocates is a particular form 
of the analysis. It's not the only one you could think about. Well, I'd like to conclude just as I thought maybe when we came here that there'd be blood on the floor and you'd be yelling at each other. It turns out that modesty reigns. You are just a modest connectomist. You want to do a little as quickly as you can, and, and you are a modest objector to the connectome. In a cottage. Yes. So I apologize that this fight did not get as bloody as I hoped it would. <laughs> it's but because you two were between us. Yeah, right. Give us a chance. Yeah, <laughs> sure that, anyway, so thank you all for a very modest and delightful thank evening. Thank you. Thank you.